Hello again, everyone. Welcome back. We are starting our articulations lab. Here's some cool animations of some of the joints that we're going to be looking at this lecture. By now, you should know that you are doing this lab all on your own. You will not have any review in labs. Uh, this has been open since the beginning of the semester. Slides have been out. Uh, if you are just kind of tuning in early, trying to get ahead, make sure you schedule yourself some time to get into open labs and to spend a little bit of extra time looking at some of the slides and the models that have been out this whole time for you. Now, the joint types that we're going to be looking at are outlined here on this uh, slide. We have our bony joints on the left, fibrous, cartilaginous, and then synovial all the way on the right. Now these are organized uh, based on their mobility that occurs. So the bony joints are immobile and the synovial joints are the neat, most movable. Now what you'll also notice is there are going to be some new and confusing terms here. So synostosis, syndesmosis, synchondrosis, and symphysis. So you'll be needing to spend some time practicing these as they all sound somewhat similar. Um, so make sure you're writing this out or create some kind of visual study guide uh, that you can tie these uh, complicated terms to. We'll start with bony joints. Uh, another term for these is called synostosis. You can see SES in, in um, parentheses there. If they are synostoses, uh, then that is plural. So IS is singular, SES uh, is going to be plural. Now this is where we have two separate bones that fuse to become one bone. So they are immobile. If you remember from our previous lecture going over our skull, we learned about our frontal bones, we learned about our mandibular bone, our maxilla bones. These bones are fusing, there's two of them, and they fuse together. Another example that you'll be learning a lot more about in the appendicular lecture is the epiphysis and the diaphysis. At this region between the epiphysis, the end of the long bone, and the diaphysis, the shaft of the long bone, we have a hyaline cartilage separation. It's called the epiphyseal plate. So we have some hyaline cartilage there, and this is where the bone is growing uh, proximally and distally. As we get older, that epiphyseal plate ossifies it and it becomes the epiphyseal line. I always kind of think of children need to be reminded to clean their plate. And so when we're younger, we have the epiphyseal plate. So here is a long bone. Here's a cross section of a long bone. And down here, we can see the epiphyseal line. We can also see an epiphyseal line right up in here. These are our growth plates. And so when we are younger, um, this is not totally fused. So we have our epiphyseal plate. At this point in time, you can see that this is labeled the epiphyseal line. So this would be an adult bone. On to our fibrous joints. Fibrous joints are holding adjacent bones together with collagen fibers. We've talked a lot about the importance of collagen fibers up until this point. Our first type of fibrous joints are sutures, and these can be found between the bones and our cranium. A gomphosis is where we're holding a tooth into the socket. And last is our syndesmosis. So we have connective tissue, longer connective tissue, than we see in our sutures and our gomphosis. And this joint is holding together our tibia with our fibula or our radius and our ulna. So let's first look at a suture. These are uh, essentially immovable and they are only in our skull. So we have three types. The first type is a serrated, and this is where we have these interlocking wavy lines. Uh, we also have a lap suture. Uh, this was the squamous suture. If you remember this between the parietal and the temporal bone, this is where two bones are overlapping and sort of have these beveled edges. Third is our plain suture or a butt suture. And these, um, the two bones butt up next to each other. So we saw this 
with our palatine processes off of those maxilla bones. With our gomphosis, this again is where we see that tooth in our socket here. And so if we look a little bit closer, we can see these periodontal ligaments that are holding that tooth in place into that bone. And so again, we see collagen fibers from that jaw to that tooth. When you're eating, your tooth actually wiggles a little bit. And this sends information back to our brains to understand how hard we're biting or if there's some food stuck in between our teeth. And for those of you that have had braces, this is essentially what we're reforming. Last is our syndesmosis. So here we can see that we are holding these two bones together by this interosseous membrane. And so uh, they have some movement. They're the most movable of our fibrous joints. And so we see this between our radius and ulna, as well as our uh, tibia and fibula. Our third type of joint are the cartilaginous joints. Cartilaginous joints are linking bones together by cartilage. So our first type of cartilaginous joints are, is a symphysis or the symphyses for plural. Bones in these joints are bound together by fibrocartilage. So when we look at our pubic bones or our intervertebral discs, we see that this is our fibrocartilaginous joint. Basically, this is cartilage with a lot more uh, collagen fiber bundles mixed into that matrix of the cartilage. The synchondroses are where bones are bound together with hyaline cartilage. Uh, we just saw this with our epiphyseal plate in children. And if you have watched the axial skeleton lecture, when we talked about the costal cartilage going from your ribs to your sternum, uh, this is also hyaline cartilage and a synchondrosis. This offers a little bit more flexibility. Cartilage is a connective tissue, has a rubbery matrix, it does not have blood vessels in there. It relies on diffusion. We saw this when we talked about our integumentary system between our epidermal layers and our dermal layers. And so again, with cartilage, we don't have those blood vessels there. So um, nutrients and wastes move much slower. So when your cartilage is damaged, it takes a little bit longer to heal. As a recap, Two bones are joined with fibrocartilage, and again, there is only a slight amount of movement. So if we look a little bit closer at fibrocartilage, cartilage with these extensive parallel collagen fibers, and we can see this in the bottom image, uh, highlighting a lot of these collagen fiber bundles. Uh, we find this in the pubic symphysis, meniscus, or intervertebral discs. So it's very versatile in its functions. It's resisting compression. It's absorbing shock. It's also reducing wear and tear. Now you'll also notice up here, uh, we can see that our chondrocytes are sitting within lacuna. And we learned these terms, or we learned the term lacuna when we first started learning about bone. And those were the little spaces where the osteocytes resided. And so since we're talking about cartilage here, we now have chondrocytes or cartilage cells. In our synchondrosis, our bones again are joined by our hyaline cartilage. So here you can see the development of a long bone. You can see that it's transitioning from a hyaline cartilage scaffold into a much more complex bone where that cartilage has been replaced by bone tissue. Up here, we can see the residual hyaline cartilage that's left at that epiphyseal plate. Taking a closer look at hyaline cartilage, we can see it looks a lot different from what we saw in our fibrocartilage. So it has clear glassy matrix, some collagen fibers that are dispersed throughout, and again, we can see lacunae here with the chondrocytes sitting inside of those lacunae, and those lacunae are somewhat clustered. We find those at the ends of our long bones, uh, covering the epiphyses at the sites of articulation, over the sternal ends of our ribs, supporting our larynx, our trachea, and our bronchi, as well as in the fetal skeleton. 
This tissue reduces friction and, and also helps keep those airways open. And last is our elastic cartilage. The elastic cartilage, as we can see up in the top image, we have a web-like mesh of elastic fibers. And we see the lacuni and we see those chondrocytes sitting within those lacuni. When you're looking at this under a microscope, it can trick you uh, to think that you're looking at spongy bones. So again, spend some time practicing these slides. We find this in our external ear and the epiglottis to name a couple of places. And again, it's offering some flexibility because of those elastic tissues. Our last joint type and our most movable joint type are the synovial joints. As we look here on this person's hand, we can see we've got our proximal phalanx here, our middle phalanx here, and we're gonna look at that individual joint. So we're gonna zoom in on that. And what we can see are the ligaments holding these two bones together. And if you remember, a ligament is that dense regular connective tissue, so it's really strong in the direction of those fibers. And that's gonna weave into that dense irregular connective tissue, that periosteum that's gonna surround our bone. Now deep to those ligaments, we see that we have our joint capsule. And that joint capsule is made up of this fibrous capsule, that's a little more superficial, and our synovial membrane that's deep to that. And that synovial membrane is going to contain and produce synovial fluid. And that synovial fluid you can think of as like the oil in the engine of your car or truck. It's going to lubricate the movement of those bones so it reduces friction. Together with the articular cartilage surrounding the ends of those bones, this is hyaline cartilage, we reduce friction uh, which is going to be really helpful for our long-term movements. So some other characteristics. Uh, our bones are separated by our synovial fluid, which I had brief briefly mentioned. Our joint capsule uh, is our fibrous capsule and that synovial membrane, and that is going to be continuous with that periosteum. Our synovial fluid is kind of similar to egg white. So tomorrow when you crack open a couple of eggs for breakfast and put your finger in there and feel those egg whites that's kind of what your synovial fluid will look like and then that articular cartilage again is that hyaline cartilage surrounding the ends of those long bones our synovial cavity is the space in that joint that's filled with that fluid and what we'll also see is uh, a meniscus and this is a pad of fibrocartilage that we see to help absorb, absorb shock and help direct the bone movements and kind of guide them and, and distribute forces. Some of you may have torn a meniscus in sports injuries, uh, and so you might be really familiar with this. There's all kinds of varying degrees of tears. Um, so some of you may have just gone to PT. Some of you may have actually had surgery on that. Don't forget that tendons are what attaches muscles to bones and ligaments are attaching our bones to other bones. What's important to think about is those synovial joints and what happens long term. They can get to the point where they don't even move. These, these um, bones can actually ossify or fuse together. With rheumatoid arthritis though, this is an autoimmune disorder that sometimes can occur in children, but usually occurs in older individuals and more often in, in females than in males. Basically, your immune system is attacking the synovial membrane and fluid is building up inside of that joint. As that fluid builds up, Enzymes uh, start to also build up in that fluid and they end up breaking down the articular cartilage. And so as your articular cartilage is breaking down, you are losing that lubrication and those bones can ossify or fuse together. Here's just another example uh, to compare a normal joint with osteoarthritis. Now osteoarthritis is 
kind of what we think about with just overuse. So you've been maybe a football player or you've been a soccer player or a professional skier who goes through moguls. You're beating up that joint, you're destroying that cartilage, and eventually you start rubbing bone on bone, which has a lot of friction. A couple of other things that you'll see are bursa. Bursa are small synovial sacs that are, um, exist between tendons and bones, so they act as little pillows or little cushions. And then tendon sheaths are modified bursa, and they enclose or wrap around a tendon, and that lubricates the tendon's movement, and so we see this in our hands. Back here we can see the ulnar bursa, we can see the radial bursa acting as these little pillows for these tendons and a little bit more distally we can see our tendon sheath here for those flexor digitorum uh, tendons that are going to surround the tendon and allow that to to slide by a little bit easier you may have heard of bursitis so here is the inflammation of some bursa so this is a pretty inflamed elbow we get bursitis on our plantar uh, surface of our foot as well. Now what we're going to do is look at the six types of synovial joints from the least movable to the most movable. So gliding, hinge, pivot, condyloid, saddle, ball and socket. Again, make up your own mnemonic if you want or you can say that Gary's Harley passes Charlie's silver beamer. If we're looking at our upper extremity, we've got one of our arms here uh, attached to the scapula. And we can see all six of these joints that we're looking at. So our ball and socket joint right up in here. We can see a pivot joint between the radius and ulna. We can also go up in this top right and see a hinge joint between the humerus and the ulna. We can see down here at our thumb or our pollux, we have our uh, saddle joint. And so we can see that we have these two concave surfaces that are able to move back and forth around each other. Over here in between our uh, carpals, we can see that we have our plane joint, our gliding joint here. And then in those phalanges, we can see that we have these condyloid joints that are going to offer some different types of movement. These joints are allowing for more movement. There's always pros and cons with, um, uh, with our bodies. And so with our synovial joints, when we talk about our ball and socket, they have the most mobility, but they are not very stable. And this is the most dislocated joint on our bodies. Now our first type of synovial joints are the gliding joints. This is where bones are sliding over top of each other. We mentioned earlier that we see these in our carpal bones. In the bottom right you can see two vertebrae and they have a little bit of movement where they're sliding past each other. We can call these monoaxial. They have movement in one plane. Next we have our hinge joints and we mentioned this one which was our humerus and our ulna. So we can call that our humero-ulnar joint. These again are also monoaxial but it's like a hinge on a door. Uh, we have a convex uh, surface going into a concave depression. At our elbows we see the ulna and the humerus. At our knee joints we have our femur and our tibia. The third type are our pivot joints. We have this rotation between two bones. And so right here between our radius and our ulna, we're going to have that uh, radius moving around that ulna. So it's a pivot joint, and we can call that a radial ulnar joint. Again, this is monoaxial, but another example is our atlanoaxial joint where we talked about the dens and the atlas and our proximal radial ulnar joint. Our condyloid joints uh, are biaxial, so they allow for movement in two planes. So we can see our wrist down here, 
uh, in the bottom right, moving in an, an abduction and adduction fashion, as well as flexion and extension. So our radiocarpal joints or metacarpophalangeal joints. Next, we have our saddle joints. This is where we have two concave surfaces coming together. So here, uh, the trapeziometacarpal joint at the base of our thumb. Uh, this is biaxial, so a little bit more movement than our condyloid joints or our hinge joints. Then this helps to form our opposable thumbs. And last, we have our multi-axial ball and socket joint. This is where the head of our humerus, or even our femur, is fitting into this cup-like depression on our scapula. Called the glenoid cavity. Just a quick review, the axes of movement, monoaxial meaning one, uh, plane of movement, our gliding hinge and pivot. Biaxial is our condyloid and our saddle joints, and our multiaxial is our ball and socket joint. Some specific joints that you'll need to know are glenohumeral joint, acetabulofemoral joint, humeral ulnar joint, femorotibial joint. A closer look at our acetabulofemoral joint. You can see we have ligaments that are holding the head of the femur into that acetabulum. We have a little bit of a labrum here to help uh, reduce friction. And if we zoom out, we can see that we have some ligaments helping to hold that bone in place. Now, you're not going to be responsible for any of these ligaments. It's mostly just here to show you what this looks like. That said, our tibiofemoral joint or femorotibial joint. You can, again, sometimes see it in different uh, terminology. You will be responsible for identifying these structures in the red and the blue boxes. So our lateral collateral ligament, our lateral meniscus. So here we're looking at an anterior view. So the patella has been removed. We can see our posterior cruciate ligament, PCL our anterior cruciate ligament, our ACL. And so basically these are uh, preventing an anterior or posterior movement, while the LCL, the lateral collateral ligament, and the MCL, the medial collateral ligament, are preventing a lateral and medial movement. And then we have our medial meniscus and our lateral meniscus. We talked about these earlier. Those are gonna help absorb shock and hold our lateral and medial condyles of our femur in place um, so that they're not moving around too much in that joint. From a posterior view, again, you can see all these different ligaments here. So I would study both anterior and posterior views as you will likely see this on a test. Now some interesting information about artificial joints. The knee and the hip are the most commonly replaced joints. And about 90% of patients uh, with our, their hip replacements are pain-free and walking around about 10 years after their operation. Most of the replacements have a, a polyethylene, uh, which is the, the bearing surface, and then some kind of titanium alloy for the other joint. We can see here that uh, with our prosthetic uh, joint here, we've got this metal, this titanium alloy. We've cut off part of that bone and we've drilled through the femur and put that uh, prosthetic component through that medullary cavity to help keep it in place. Another view is we can see that um, polyethylene here. So as that knee joint is flexing and extending, we have this metal sliding over this polyethylene uh, component that has been replaced on the tibia. So again, we've um, cut off part of the tibia and we've glued this in or cemented this in. And now we've got this nice lubricated joint. Here would be an artificial acetabulum and an artificial femoral head. And here's just a cool image showing a hip replacement 
And if you're working at TSA, you may come across some kind of image like this at some point in your life. At this point in our lecture, you may want to pause the video, go back over our different joint types, practice the names of those joints, work with the terminology, and then we're going to move on with some of the actions that occur at those joints that you're going to need to know when you get into your muscle labs. I hope you had a chance to review all that terminology and you're making some sense of these different types of joints and the different types of um, movements that are going to occur at each of those joints. What we're going to be looking at as we move forward are looking at specific actions and terms that go with these joints. So actions are describing a joint movement and these actions are going to be increasing or decreasing the angles at those joints. They also are going to reference different types of rotations around a joint. And you're really going to need to start practicing now because these are going to be important when you get to muscles. Every muscle that you learn about over the next three muscle labs, you will have to be able to identify an action. Now you can practice while you're working out. You can practice when you're walking to class. You can practice when you're sitting at home uh, and, and getting up to go and grab a snack, use the restroom. This is the best part about anatomy is you always have a subject with you, yourself, and you can practice all of this on yourself. So first is flexion, extension, and hyperextension. So a flexion is decreasing our joint angle. Now, if you look at this uh, guy's arm here, uh, we are, the original position is that his arm is out straight. When he flexes that forearm, or he's flexing his elbow here, he is bringing that up. And so the angle has gone from 180 degrees to a 45 degree angle. So we're shrinking or reducing that joint angle. With an extension, we're returning that movement or that body part back to an anatomical position. So we're increasing uh, that joint angle. So we're going from a 45 degree angle back to that 180 degree angle. And hyperextension then is extending the joint beyond its anatomical position. Now we can see with this individual here, she is standing up and she was in anatomical position, but she has now bent forward. And so if she was in anatomical position, she would be in an 180 degree angle. Well, when she leans forward and uh, flexes, at her hip joints there, she is leaning forward and shortening or decreasing that angle. In her middle image, what she's done now is if you think about her arms being at her sides as they are here in number one, she has moved them away from anatomical position. And so this is a shoulder flexion and the angle has gotten smaller. If she returns them back to her sides, she is extending them and bringing them back. You can also see that she is leaning back. And so she is actually in this image in a little bit of spinal hyperextension. Uh, here in the first image, she flexed. If she came back to anatomical position, she would have been in spinal extension. And the last image here, we can see that she has returned her arms back to anatomical position and actually gone beyond anatomical position. So she is hyperextending her shoulders and her neck has gone beyond anatomical position. So she is now in hyperextension of her neck. Abduction and adduction. Now, abduction, if you think about aliens taking you away, you've been abducted by aliens, abduction is 
starting an anatomical position and moving a body part away from the midline. In this image, you can see the arrows moving away from her midline. So she is abducting her arms. In this down here, if she spreads her legs, she's abducting her legs. When she brings those arms back to her midline or towards her midline, she is adducting. And I like to think of adding to the midline. So you're adding back um, and same with her feet. When she brings her feet back together, then she has adducted those legs. You can also see this with your fingers. So on the left, we have abduction. On the right, we have adduction. So we've separated those fingers. We've moved them away from the midline. That's abduction. Bringing them back to the midline is adduction. Two other actions that we can see are lateral and medial rotation. This is where we're turning a bone on its longitudinal axis and we're referencing its anterior surface. This guy here in your left image, we can see that he is laterally rotating his trunk away from that anatomical plane. And right here, he's actually medially rotating his right leg. He's turning it inwards. So he's rotating these bones about that longitudinal axis. Supination and pronation, uh, we see this in our forearms and our feet. So when you think of supination, think of holding a bowl of soup. And as you're holding that bowl of soup, as you rotate your forearm, uh, you then pour out your soup and so you're pronating um, your forearm when you supinate you're turning your uh, you're turning your forearm back to hold your bowl of soup so in supination you have the rotation of the forearm and your palm is facing anteriorly when you're pronating you're rotating that forearm and now your palms are facing posteriorly with protraction and retraction, and this is like one of my favorite anatomical photographs that I've ever seen. So protraction is the movement of a bone anteriorly along that horizontal plane. So you can see on the left here, we have this gentleman who is now projecting or protracting uh, his jaw forward. You can also do this with your shoulders or your pelvis. And then retraction is moving that bone posteriorly. Inversion and eversion, uh, we can also use supination and pronation. Inversion, I like to think of moving your feet in or turning your feet in. Those soles are rotated in medially. We can also call this supination if you think about holding a bowl of soup with your feet. And then eversion or pronation is pouring the soup out with your feet or turning the soles laterally. Then we have opposition and reposition. So when you think about our opposable thumb, opposition is taking your thumb and touching it to each of your fingertips. And this is what allowed for tool making. Reposition then is moving it back to anatomical position as we see over on the right. And then last we have dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So dorsiflexion would be this top image here where this person has lifted the foot and they're going to take a step and they're going to plant their heel on the ground. And so this is the dorsal surface of our foot. And so we are flexing the top of that foot. In plantar flexion, our plantar surface is the bottom of our foot. If you've ever heard of plantar warts, you get them on the bottom of your feet. And so basically here, you are pushing off of the ground to move forward. And this is what's important in our, in our bipedal movement. Thanks for hanging in there through this lecture. We've made it. We're done. Best of luck to you on your test this week. And we'll see you next week when we go over our appendicular skeleton.